that, um, let me introduce you to our first speaker, um, Dr. Cleary. Um, Dr. Uh, Dean uh, Paul Cleary is the Anna Lauder Professor of Public Health and Pub Health Policy at Yale University School of Medicine. He's a professor of Faculty of Arts and Sciences and Sociology. He's the Dean of Yale School of Public Health and the Director of Yale Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS. Dean Cleary received his PhD in Sociology from the University of Wisconsin. His earliest work focused on studies of health behavior around conditions such as smoking, alcohol abuse, mental and functional impairment in primary care settings. For more than 20 years, Dean Cleary has studied how organizational characteristics affect the cost and quality of care for persons with AIDS. He has authored more than 300 journal articles. Dean Cleary has been a member of the Institute of Medicine since 1994 and has chaired two IOM committees. He's also the chair of the National Advisory Committee for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Investigator Awards in Health Policy Research Program. We're lucky to have Dean Cleary here this year because in particular that this is the 100th uh, uh, year anniversary for the Yale School of Public Health, so he has a very busy speaking uh, schedule. In fact, for those um, Yale alumni amongst us, um, he will be the keynote speaker at the Yale Assembly this fall, featuring the Yale School of uh, uh, Public Health at Yale, and it's a great program. Um, so um, we're very lucky to have uh, Dean Clary speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. I get the slides. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, can you hear me with the lavalier OK? It's great to see so many uh, friends and colleagues, and uh, wonderful to be able to kick off what I think will be a uh, tremendous event. And uh, I'll just start by echoing all the thanks that uh, Allison so beautifully outlined. Thank you to everyone who made this possible. Uh, if if I'd had more room for the title, I would have had it, uh, where have we been, where are we, and what lies ahead? And the reason is, I think it's really important to think about some of the background for the uh, uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, full disclosure, I think the Affordable Care Act is a fantastic bill. I think it ranks right up there with Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Uh, but I'm not naive. I know many, many people, it's very controversial. Many people, including many of you here, object strongly either to specific provisions or the entire act uh, in and of itself. And that's okay. Reasonable people differ on how to address our problems. What I'd like us to agree on before we launch into all the discussions today is why do we even do such a crazy thing? Why are we here? What was some of the pressure of that? So that'll be some of the background to why we got here. There were fundamental problems that led us to this act. It's not perfect, uh, but I think it's incumbent upon all of us to recognize that and try and move ahead. So first, I'm gonna give you a history of about 40 years of health services research. Uh, trust me, we could talk about this for hours. These issues are well documented. Uh, there are large regional interorganizational variations in costs and quality that are not justified by anything anyone can measure or document. There are huge disparities that are inexcusable that I think almost everyone in this room would say are inexcusable or unacceptable. And the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, I thought captured it very well. They said there's not improvements to make, there's a chasm. There's a chasm between what is possible and what we're currently doing. And there I have, I could give another talk about all the innovations we've tried, oh, you know, the first implementation of health maintenance organizations, managed competition, uh, different marketplace reforms, value-based, things have been going on for the last 30 years to address these issues, but the fact of the matter is, as we moved into the era of the Affordable Care Act, there was still a huge number of uninsured, which I will show you, high costs and less than optimal quality. 
So this is a graph from the Commonwealth Fund. I know you've heard uh, uninsured rates ad nauseum, but just think of it. In 2012, nearly half of adults were uninsured or were underinsured. Okay, so you may not believe insurance, but even the Heritage Foundation, which by the way is a very conservative think tank, said we can't get a system to function unless we have broader insurance. Obviously, there are issues of equitability and access in adults, but this is a big problem. No country in the world could show you a slide like this. Uh, not only were things bad, but they weren't improving. This just shows how they were uh, increasing, and the uh, Lewin Group had estimated that by uh, 2020 it would be up to 61 million. So not just a problem, an increasing problem. And by the way, most of these are from nonpartisan. Before the Affordable Care Act, we used to talk at these conferences, it was never a partisan issue. This was never a, a Democratic or Republican issue. This was just a fundamental system problem. Uh, okay, you probably already heard this. The U.S. spends more than any other developed country. And I, I get the apples and oranges argument a lot. Well, we're not like Japan, we're not China. I was born and grew up in Toronto. If you look over there, about four lines, you see C-A-N for Canada. Canada is not that different than here. I go home every summer. I go home. My, my nephew's a surgeon. I, if I put blinders on you and took you to Toronto, you wouldn't know the difference between there and here. It's not apples and oranges. They spend about half what we do on health care. And most of my relatives are pretty healthy. Uh, speaking of do we get for what we pay for, another argument I hear a lot is we have, I have heard so many times, we have the best healthcare system in the world, I'm willing to pay for it, uh, I think it's great, stop messing up a great system. This graph is the relationship between what we spend up here on the left, this left, uh, well this doesn't show up, the left axis, and across the right is GDP per capita, in other words, gross domestic product. People say, well, we're more affluent, we should spend more. If you see, there's a little dot up on the top there, the U.S. We are off the curve in terms of what we spend per GDP. Uh, this is another graph that not only are spend is on insurance getting worse, these are graphs of how um, spending was getting worse, either absolute or as a percent of GDP, and diverging. Um, I actually, I hate to admit my age, but I actually started doing work in the early 80s. In the early 80s, we used to have these talks. The U.S. was above other countries, but it, the differences were minuscule to what we're experiencing lately. So this is a, a, a huge and diverging problem, and I could show you other graphs where they would show within our lifetimes about 150% of GDP would be used by healthcare. Obviously, that can't happen. Obviously, this is an unsustainable model. So before Obama even showed up on the stage, we were at a point we could not afford what we were doing. I won't go through this because Chen correctly asked me to move through this quickly, but David Blumenthal did this calculation. What if the United States had increased its health care spending at the same rate that Switzerland did. One of the and how many of you have been to Switzerland? Okay, Switzerland's a pretty cool country. Switzerland's got a pretty good health care system. Uh, Switzerland has excellent health. If we had kept our rate of improvement at the rate that Switzerland had, we would have transformed our $12 trillion deficit into a $4 trillion surplus. And there's other sometimes kind of silly analogs here. There's a lot of money we put into this system over that period. So this is not, you know, we're willing to pay for, we make more. This is a big deal. Um, you might say, well, we're affluent, we spend money, I'm willing to spend the money. I could show you hundreds of slides like this that show there are consequences uh, of not having an optimal healthcare system. So this is one, I won't go through the details, but if you ask people, have they had access problems of about three or four times, how often do they say that? And these are the percent of adults in the United States, it happens to be 37% uh, in 2007, and you look at the other countries, again, just to get around the apples and oranges argument, 
I from, come from Canada. The surveys in Canada show 12 percent. In the United States, it's about three or four times as high. So we're paying a lot, we're paying a lot, and we're not getting access. Why are the costs so high? We have some eminent economists speaking, and we'll get into some details, but let me just show you uh, a couple numbers. One is uh, we're different. Uh, we have different racial and ethnic populations. We have, there's a whole variety of things you could posit result in the higher costs in the United States. And this is a very complex graph, but I'll just say the red part in these graphs is age and sex. So I often hear, well, the U.S. is aging, there are gender differences, uh, other non-price factors are those green things. Uh, the blue parts of the graph are prices. So we actually pay more per unit of the things, per widget, uh, than other countries, and this is a huge component of the increase in crisis. Uh, so these are graphs of drugs and physician fees. Now I know drug prices have been in the news a lot lately, but take away some of the noise around orphan drugs and sort of these exorbitant price increases. These are, I'll just look at one number. If you go to the left column, uh, these are an average of prices for 30 most commonly prescribed drugs, not some esoteric drug or not hepatitis C and so on. Uh, but other countries pay, if you look at the bottom left number, 43% what we pay in the United States for these. Um, primary care physicians, uh, if you go to public players like Medicare and Medicaid, uh, sorry, I don't, this, it's a little, uh, whoops. I'll stop trying to use the pointer. Um, we pay about the same as other countries, but a thir about 30% more. For those of you who are the private payers uh, in the audience, we pay about 30% more for physicians. And if you get an orthopedic surgeon, you also have a premium. Go over to the second to the right column. Uh, sorry, are there any orthopedic surgeons in the? Okay, this is fair then. Uh, the media, the uh, United States, the average fee is 1634. That seems like a reasonable number. It doesn't seem exorbitant, but go up that chart. Canada doesn't have the private K. Uh, my nephew happens to be a, a general surgeon, uh, but he makes about half what a surgeon uh, here makes. But by the way, my nephew lives a, a very, very good lifestyle. And seem, his kids seem happy, they seem well fed and so on. Uh, another big component, uh, you've heard about the perverse incentives around fee-for-service, or if you haven't, let me tell you, there are perverse incentives in the fee-for-service system. One of the perverse incentives is that we are paid to do things. And one of the things we are paid to do is do scans. Now, scans are fantastic. Technology has revolutionized medicine. It has helped me. It has helped many of you. So, so don't get me wrong. Scans are great. But if you look at MRI machines on the left, for example, of all these countries, the median is 8.9. Can't sorry to keep picking on Canada, but Canada has about eight per million population, and the U.S. has 26. Uh, the number of exams is about double in the United States as the median, and so on. You could go across this graph. Uh, and we can get to a discussion later, maybe it's appropriate. No one I know in healthcare thinks the amount of scanning we're doing is appropriate. We can have that discussion. We're doing double what anyone else in the world is doing, and we pay much, much more for it. I was giving this talk in the UK once, and they said, well, we do more brain scans, but we have more brains than those people in the UK. I don't know, it didn't go over well. Uh, and these are the fees, for example, for an MRI scan. And you may think here prices are perfectly appropriate, but I, I don't know, $1,500 versus, uh, you know, twice as much as you would pay if I fly to Toronto and get an MRI on my shoulder, twice as much. This isn't for the, you know, the consult, it's not for the read, it's just to do the scan. Um, this is, uh, a compilation from the National Research Council Institute of Medicine report that was done a couple of years uh, in terms of outcome. Let me get back to that argument. We pay more, we do more. What if, it, what if we benefit from all these MRI scans? What if we benefit from all these CAT scans? 
The bottom line to this, and you can read this, is we do lousy compared to other developed countries. Compared to the 17 high income countries that they reviewed, we have high rates of HIV and heart disease, obesity uh, is off the chart, we live shorter and have poorer health. And I actually added this because I was asked the apple and oranges question every time I bring these issues up. That report also looked at white, insured, college educated, and upper income Americans. Does that ring a bell to anyone in this audience? Uh, are in poorer health than their counterparts in other countries. So, so we pay more, we do more, we don't have access, and we get worse outcomes. So there's some motivation here for doing this. Uh, and this again is uh, healthcare spending per capita and average life expectancy. Remember how I showed you our costs are off the chart? Okay, well maybe we're doing better. This is mortality, uh, expenditures along the bottom, mortality is along the left axis. So you'd like us to be in the bottom left. You might notice the USA is way out there on the right, meaning we spend a lot and if you look over to the left, we're below most of those other countries in terms of life expectancy. So there was motivation. Another point I want to make is this isn't all Obama's fault. There were many, many things going on before the Affordable Care Act was even proposed. There was the uh, state child health insurance program, HIT initiatives were forging ahead. Um, there was talk all over the country about uh, voluntary efforts to reduce costs and businesses all over the country, and I can name the various coalitions, were gonna make things change. I, I, uh, Yale had a healthcare conference about, right before the Affordable Care Act and said, someone said, well, what's gonna happen if the Affordable Care Act doesn't pass? And uh, the speaker uh, said, uh, you know, I don't think a lot's gonna change a lot is going to change from the business community. There is so much pressure right now to change that we are going to see a transformation in healthcare. So people want to blame it on Obama. I actually give him credit for doing this, but whatever your persuasions or your opinions about this, this was happening. This was a train coming down the track because of the reason about costs and quality that I showed you. Okay. You're gonna hear a lot. Meredith is gonna talk about finance reforms and service reforms. I just wanna give you a couple big picture points about the Affordable Air, uh, Care Act. There are 10 titles. We hear a lot about mandated insurance. Uh, we hear a lot about premiums. We hear a lot about uh, you know contraception coverage and so on. Uh, one thing I hear a lot is, well, you know, they make everyone get insurance, but there's nothing being done to control costs or quality. Well, most of us would like there to be more being done about costs and quality, but there's a lot. There are 10 titles with a lot of things going on. I can't, don't worry, I'm not going to go through <laughs> each of these in detail. I want to give you a sense uh, of how much is actually happening. Uh, one political comment, you probably saw people in Congress you know, holding up papers saying, I have a health care bill that's much better than the Affordable Care Act. Well, I had ideas too that were much better than the Affordable Care Act. Mark had ideas, Amanda had ideas, Meredith had it, everyone had ideas. This is a political process. Now mind you, uh, it got shoved through without Republican support, um, but there was a lot of negotiation. This is a compromise. And, I think, my colleagues can correct me, virtually every uh, proposal in the Affordable Care Act at some point in the last 10 or 20 years had strong bipartisan support or was proposed by Republican administrations. So this is not like a communist government takeover. This is like, uh, this is a compilation of things that have happened over several decades. So I'll just go quickly through these titles to give you a sense. Um, I believe Meredith is, gonna, Meredith is gonna talk about some of these reforms, but clearly the big issue that most people talk about is a um, guaranteed issue. People have to have insurance if we're gonna have insurance covered uh, population. There's the mandate, we were mandated to have insurance, and this is heavily subsidized. So this is what we mostly have heard about, and I won't go into detail about that. Uh, 
you're obviously very aware of state insurance exchanges, which is much, much more fundamental, important, by the way, than the, you know, the website at, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the insurance exchange website. And there's an employer mandate. By the way, these ideas, a lot of these came out of the Heritage Foundation, a lot of them, or foundation, a lot of them were tested in Massachusetts and places. Pretty much, I, I think most economists would agree, to really get a system functioning, you have to have fairly universal coverage to get pooled. You know, I was talking to someone before, we, we couldn't have auto insurance or health insurance unless people had to have insurance. Uh, you can't just have, you can't have dramatic risk selection. Uh, Medicaid was dramatically reformed. Uh, you may, before the Supreme Court decision, the bill said that everyone, uh, the eligibility was raised to 133% of the federal poverty level. Um, that is now state by state decisions, and I'll show you some data. Federal financing and standardizing the eligibility standards. Um, so what are the results of this? And pr you'll probably see more graphs of this throughout the day. We haven't covered everyone, but there has been a dramatic increase on the population covered. Um, some of this had uh, to do with the Medicaid expansions. Some of it had to do with the subsidies. Uh, but I think, um, my guess is everyone in this room, either individually or a relative or a friend, has been covered who didn't used to be covered through the Affordable Care Act. Um, the private markets have been changed dramatically, and, and you know, there's a lot of debate about this. I happen to think this is perfectly appropriate for a national market. There's now the mandate. Uh, your children are uh, covered under your policy up to 26. No limits on uh, lifetime coverage and no discrimination against certain conditions, pre-existing conditions and so on. The marketplaces and the uh, what we call the loss ratio or the administrative costs are uh, now regulated. Okay, one of the questions I hear is there's no delivery system reform, and Meredith, I believe you're gonna be talking about some of this in detail, uh, and I won't go through these. I'll mention a couple. Uh, just read this slide. There are programs, there are about a dozen programs that are aimed at modifying the system. Uh, I agree uh, mandated coverage doesn't fix the system. I agree there's not been a dramatic transformation of the system as of Saturday morning. But I tell you, there are a lot of things going on, and these are in addition to what private purchasers are doing. So there is a lot, there's more activity right now in the medical marketplace than I've seen ever, maybe even cumulatively in my 40 years of looking at interventions and programs and efforts to change health care. And uh, there's also been a variety of changes to lower Medicare spending. Uh, I'll show you some of this. Uh, you may not even realize this. One of the things economists have been talking about since uh, Medicare Advantage, which used to be called Medicare Managed Care, went into place. Uh, was that it, uh, they were getting excess premiums. The Medicare Advantage plans were getting higher than justified premiums. Um, and part of the motivation for that, you may remember during the Bush administration, there was a big push to use managed care to control costs, which, you know, by the way, I think was a, a reasonable idea and thing to do. Um, but there were premiums there that never went, there were excess premiums there that never went away. So those have been reduced. Um, huge cost implications. I, you heard I'm in a school of public health, so I think fondly of prevention and wellness. Uh, there was a huge prevention uh, initiative. Much of that has been uh, stripped away and gutted, and some of those funds have been reallocated, but that was one of the provisions in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I, I thought I'd give you just, of those system innovations, I thought I'd give you just one little example. Uh, there is a part of Medicare, or, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, which is called the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMMI. They were allocated $10 billion to undertake uh, experiments, basically. And one of the things I hear often is that this is a federal takeover. The reality is most of the innovation right now is state-specific, or at least that's my opinion. And there is unbelievable amounts of innovation going on at the states, and there's unbelievable heterogeneity. 
So for example, in Connecticut, uh, we got one of these state innovation model grants. It's about $44 million. And basically, the state has been given resources to transform uh, primary care. Uh, we're really promoting uh, advanced medical homes. There's oh, all kinds of experiments started with value-based purchasing, value-based insurance design. Uh, their IT initiatives, we're monitoring indicators. So I'm si I was astounded when I got to Connecticut, with all due respect for those of you who went to Yale, it was kind of a backwater of medical innovation in terms of system reform at least. Not, I'm not talking about technically. Um, it has dramatic, I, I came from uh, Boston where all kinds of things are happening. I, I've never seen so much change. Um, huge moves of uh, medical groups and so on. So, and you may think those are bad changes, good changes, but change uh, is happening. Another issue uh, covered by the Affordable Care Act is uh, who's going to do all this work. Um, the drafters of the act thought about that. Uh, there were several programs focused around the healthcare workforce. And I won't go into details, but there were efforts to increase primary care workforce, primary care expansions, uh, CHCs, National Health Service Corps, and so on. And uh, a lot of efforts to use transparency and what I would call market forces to help reinforce or promote some of these changes going on. So you may have seen more initiatives to have access to pricing. Uh, you hear periodically about Medicare and Medicaid fraud and abuse, those kinds of things are being acted on, elder justice. Uh, there's an organization now, which is a, a quasi-governmental private organization called the Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute, which does something called comparative effectiveness research. It's a, pretty basic idea if you have options of doing A or B for let's say uh, joint arthroplasty or revascularization or something, we ought to test which is better. Does that seem like a reasonable idea? Uh, it's become hugely politicized and PCOR has become a uh, political lightning rod. It never occurred, to, I, you know, I used to think I was a wonk off in my office doing comparative effectiveness research and now it's become a political issue, but uh, that was one of the initiatives. Um, there are two areas here uh, I won't go into, but one is, has to do with biosimilars. Remember I mentioned the big uh, drug price issues, so there have been some uh, initiative. And by the way, I don't agree with some democratic proposals in this area, but uh, it's another issue. Uh, a, lot of it, a lot of thought was given to biosimilars and how that might help, and uh, there's something there was a big, uh, an entire title focused on persons with disability. Um, I won't go into that because that was dropped before the act was actually implemented. I think it probably, it had some fundamental issues related to the financing of the program. One of my best friends actually led the development of class, so I felt kind of bad, but uh, it, it was left on the, uh, another Harvard professor, but it, it was left on the cutting floor. And uh, there are a variety of revenue provisions. I was at the uh, American Board of Medical Specialties board meeting and I was on a bus and one of the physicians said, do you know they're gonna tax my house to pay for Obamacare? I said, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, uh, there are taxes though. Uh, you can't do this uh, for free and there are new taxes. So the FICA increases for uh, high income on uh, both earned and unearned income. So my taxes went up on this. Uh, there are new fees on insurers and drug manufacturers and device makers, uh, and some of those have been modified or rolled back, but that was part of the provision. Uh, there's a Cadillac tax uh, that will be implemented, I believe, next year, uh, 2018. Uh, so what that means is if uh, I actually changed uh, my insurance policy at Yale, because if I had kept the previous one, there would have been an additional tax um, because of the, the uh, benefits and the uh, provisions and so on. And um, there was a sidecar, there was also, I, I don't know if you saw the last uh, title, but there was a variety of changes uh, both in the, um, to get the Senate votes and then in the reconciliation process. You, it may be dim memory now, but during the implementation there was all the back and forth and so, uh, 
it is true that the Republicans did not support it, but it is not true that there was no negotiation about this. There was a lot of back and forth and negotiations that uh, occurred on that. So that's a three minute view of, or a 10 minute view of the Affordable Care Act. Again, my point is to give you a sense of how much is in there and was done and is in play. This is just to say um, that enormous number of people have been contacted. Uh, millions have received more preventive services that they would not have before the Affordable Care Act, um, especially women's health care. Um, children are projected to be benefited. Uh, lifetime benefits that have been covered. And these, these data, by the way, come from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, consumer rebates related to this loss ratio provision I was telling you about have been uh, estimated to be $3 billion. And the premium rate review, which is related, also billions of dollars. So there's billions of dollars. And those of you who are insurers may say it was squeezed out of you unfairly. Those of you who are just consumers or providers, there's a lot of money here um, that has come out of the system to be spread in different ways. Um, there's something that uh, many of you don't have to worry about, uh, but I do. There, in the Medicare coverage, there was a gap. It, it was really just a uh, legislative glitch, but that was filled. And uh, again, as a public health professional, free wellness visits uh, affecting numerous people. Um, I've already told you that people have been covered in a way they weren't. Um, estimates, you know, 25, 30, 40 million people are now covered who didn't used to be. Uh, I thought this was an interesting graph. I just got this from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Uh, there's a, always a large, those of you who run hospitals or healthcare system know there's always a large number, or traditionally have been a large number of uninsured uh, hospital stays. The orange graph there is the number of uninsured hospitalizations in those of who are in the states which have expanded Medicaid. And the blue graph is the number of uninsured hospital states in the states that have not expanded Medicaid. So you may think that's a good or bad thing, but the I think it's a good thing, um, but it has had a huge impact, Medicaid expansion on something. Um, I'm talking too long, so I won't go through this, just to say that there have been numerous changes in those access problems that I mentioned. I will say, in fairness, some things I predicted confidently, I'm, by the way, I'm wrong a lot. Uh, one of the things I predicted confidently would be that um, inappropriate emergency room visits would drop precipitously uh, when this happened. And, and in fact, we have pretty good data that that's not happening. Uh, you know, not everything we expected or wanted or hoped is happening. But there are a lot of really good things here. It's, and it's, you know, it's, it's not black or white. It's a very mixed bag. But a lot of good things are happening. Um, you have all heard, someone, I was just talking to a young woman this morning. She said, well, I hear our premiums are going to go up 40%. Uh, I've talked to other people saying, well, my premiums have gone down. All of those stories you've heard, and you've probably heard hundreds, could be true. And the answer is, there's a incredible amount of variability. So these are changes in the premiums nationally between 2014 and 15, and you can see the variability. So that some states there's been a decrease, and some states there's been an increase. Overall, there hasn't been much increase. Another graph showing this again, remember I started by saying, where did we come from? The one on the right is 2010 to 2013, and the one on the left is pre-implementation. And the colors, the dark colors are more increased. So if you say, well, Affordable Care Act, my premiums are increasing. Well, I hate to tell you, your, increase, your premiums always were increasing, and they were going to continue increasing. And in fact, they've increased less is the bottom line. Um, I had to show this, though. In fairness, you might notice that Portland, Oregon is at the top. There is variability, and your premiums last year increased 6%, and they're projected to increase not 40%, but 23%. So we can debate, you know, how the markets vary and so on, but I, I'm just acknowledging for some people, a lot of people, premiums go up. But it's also good to look at the big picture. Things were increasing before this happened, 
and there's a tremendous amount of variability. Um, I won't go into the detail here. This is just to say, again, you've heard about Medicaid expansion. You've probably thought a lot about it if you're from Oregon or California. Uh, I think the only take home I would leave with you about this slide is the amount of experimentation that's going on in the marketplace. Different states are trying different things, and I actually think that's a great thing. I work with the, I'm on the board of the Millbank Memorial Fund. We work a lot with something called the Reforming States Group, where state legislators get together and behind closed doors with Vegas rules, and they discuss common issues, and they're all trying to do the same thing. They're trying to provide coverage, good health care, and that, that gives them an opportunity to get out of the political glare and try and do this. And so a lot of states are doing really innovative, inter and I don't know which of these states is the right one. There's some amazing things in there, like state-run marketplaces. It's amazing what people are doing. So there's a lot going on that we're gonna know a tremendous amount from in coming years. I'll just skip over this. Uh, I'll skip over this. Affordable, uh, accountable care organizations have been booming. We can talk about those later if you're interested. Um, one of the things we hear a lot about is inappropriate or unnecessary readmissions. Um, and the good news is they have been dropping. By the way, um, I'll show you a lot of, I have a lot of graphs. I could show you that things are getting better economically and in certain things. I would be dishonest if I didn't admit there was a financial crisis that might have influenced some of this, but uh, things are moving in the right direction. Um, I'll skip over that. Oh, this is just a survey that uh, just came out. Uh, many of you may say life has gotten intolerable, there's not enough primary care physician. This is a survey of a couple thousand physicians around the country. Um, most providers are seeing more patients. Uh, most providers say there has not been a corresponding decrease in quality. Um, a lot of providers are satisfied. Um, it is true, many physicians are uh, worried about the future and they're very, very, I just did a statewide survey in Connecticut and 70% had felt burned out at some point in the previous year. Um, but I've been doing statewide physician surveys for about 10 or 15 years, and it's not all attributable to the Affordable Care Act. Some of these other pressures were acting, and people, so, so I, I understand that, and I feel it, but I, my personal opinion is, is that making these changes will make life better and not worse, and a lot of these things were uh, in play before the Affordable Care Act. Um, let me just say that, uh, and I, I believe my economist colleagues will support me on this, uh, costs certainly didn't go down. The rate of increase has gone down. And so basically the top left line is what people were estimating in 2006 for Medicare expenditures. Uh, the darkest line is what they're estimating in 2014. So as time goes on, people are estimating that the rate of increase uh, will level or go down. And this graph basically shows, this is uh, national health expenditures as a share of gross domestic product. You can see, like I showed you before, it was going up and up and up, and in the last few years it has been flat. So we're using about the same amount of the gross domestic product. Um, full disclosure, uh, this happened after a financial crisis. And so economists are unclear why this happened. Certainly some of it had to do with financial situation. I think the majority of economists would say it was at least in part due to these system reforms that were going on. Okay, um, that was where we, sorry, this is like 18 cities in four days, but uh, this is where we came from. Uh, what's the Affordable Care Act? Tried to give you a sense of the breadth of the act. Where are we going? I, I don't have a clue, but I'll give you some speculation. Many parts of the Affordable Care Act, in spite of what you read every day in the newspaper, are broadly endorsed by Republicans, Independents, and Democrats. In fact, as I said in the beginning, most of these provisions have been broadly supported by Republicans and Democrats throughout the last several decades. So a lot of these things like um, exist, uh, getting, who could not want to get rid of pre-existing condition exclusions? It just does not make any sense financially, economically, morally. There, 
things, and there's about 10 of these things. Um, there are going to be, whether you like them or not, continued implementation, expansion, experimentation with accountable care organizations. They're developing in Connecticut, they're in Oregon, they're in virtually every state uh, in the country. We're working with uh, CMS on uh, evaluation of ACOs around the country. I can talk about that. Pay for value programs, meaning you know reimbursement depends on value, uh, value-based insurance design implementation. We have three experiments in Connecticut about to start on value-based premium design experiments. So this is happening. If affordable, if you know, Baynard had stayed on and been able to repeal Obamacare, this slide would be almost exactly the same. There would still be experiments in value, uh, pay for value programs. People would still be making accountable care organizations. There would still be reforms in the Medicare uh, payment rates and we would still be refining quality metrics. I think those are gonna happen. Um, what the other side of it is, I mentioned the CMMI, the Innovation Center, that is being attacked. If uh, certain members of Congress had their way, that would be eliminated. I mentioned Pete Corey uh, has been explicitly attacked. Uh, certain members of Congress would like to have that eliminated. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, which happens to fund a lot of the work I do, actually was zeroed out uh, in a previous House version of the bill. The entire agency was eliminated, um, but then there was some compromise work, and now the budget's only reduced 35%. The, this is an agency, that it's, it's minuscule in the federal government, but it does healthcare services research, looks at the efficiency and quality of healthcare, and I was, Rick Kronick, uh, Mark and I were just at a conference and we were saying, how could this happen? How could someone, you know, all we do is sit around trying to study the quality of health care. And he said, well, it's associated with, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and so they want to eliminate it. So it's, it's I'm not saying we're uh, uh, all roses and, you know, it's all rosy ahead of us. And there will continue to be uh, attacks on public health demonstration programs. Again, you know, I'm a public health person, so I think it was, you know, too little, too late, uh, but it's become associated with uh, government intervention and so being attacked. Uh, I, there is going to continue uh, being trench warfare. Uh, there will not be a, re this is my prediction, remember I told you my predictions are usually wrong. Uh, I do not think there will be a uh, repeal of uh, the Affordable Care Act, but there will be uh, repeal mandates. There will be cuts in subsidies wherever they can find them. Uh, Medicaid expansions will be uh, reduced. That's a state decision, but I think there will be a lot of that going on. Obviously, the president will fight uh, with Congress, and we'll see what happens in the next uh, presidential election. And the bottom line is, I think all this talk about repeal or replace is, uh, you know, blowing smoke really quite honestly, to use a colloquial phrase. Um, I started out by saying there are reasonable people have legitimate differences about what healthcare reform should, could, will be, and I think that's a healthy debate. Um, there are many aspects of the Affordable Care Act that even the most avid supporters, and I count myself among those individuals, uh, would like to see change. and. My uh, hope is that we'll get to that where these discussions will actually lead to changes rather than the uh, trench warfare that I mentioned at the beginning. So sorry to go over so much so fast, but my colleagues will be able to fill in the details and thank you very much for listening. And I believe we have two minutes and 30 seconds for questions. We were told to stay very tight to our, yes, ma'am. So the question was, one of the issues that was not addressed in the Affordable Care Act uh, was uh, tort reform or for the rest of, you know, malpractice insurance and so on. And, and the, uh, there were actually were several proposals that were developed to be part of reform, but it's obviously a third rail and the, I think the Democrats are not gonna touch that. Uh, 
legislatively. Uh, that having been said, uh, there are some amazing, uh, I think, experiments going around, on around the country on uh, di disclosure experiments uh, and collaborations between insurers and providers to think about how to reduce um, the inefficiencies and illogical parts of uh, malpractice. Uh, I, I don't, my colleagues may differ, I, I don't see it uh, being legislated in my lifetime. And I, I think the Democrats are the main impediment to that. I think most Democrats I talk to, everyone I talk to thinks there should be tort reform. Um, but uh, I don't think it's gonna happen. Yes, sir. No, I heard, I heard the beginning part. So, so uh, again, my opinion, I, I mean, I tried to show you facts, but you're asking, my, my opinion is it's about the, um, it's the politicization. Um, the tri if you look at the trials and the research that's being done, I, I don't know of a single, let me think, I don't know of a single study, and I do a lot of work with PCORI, and I do a lot of work with ARC, that if I sat down with my most avid Republic friends and my most avid, Democrat friends and say, do you object to this question being asked? I, I can't think of a single thing. You know, Congress periodically picks out, you know, uh, seemingly peripheral or irrelevant uh, research. That's not the kind of research that uh, PCORI or ARC does. So I've never seen anyone object to a PCORI study or an ARC study. Years ago, ARC had a study um, that established guidelines for uh, back surgery that really recommended more watchful waiting and so on. And there was a huge kerfuffle. Uh, the orthopedic surgeon said it was unfair and inappropriate, and they tried to defund ARC at that time. But there's nothing like that right now. There's no one objecting to what they're finding. Is that, it's, just, it's just political. It's just, it's apocryphal. Yeah, and I, I was asking Rick, is there, is there anything you do they object to? No. And by the way, he's, he, he had spent the previous week, you know, preparing testimony for Congress. So everyone, everything's, it's not just Congress, everything's grinding to a halt because of this. Yes, sir. The expansion of Medicaid has been something that I've heard about, and the coverage that it puts in the Uh, that's a great question, uh, and uh, I'd sort of defer to my colleagues. I, as I said, some of the early expansions have not resulted in some of the quote-unquote savings, financial savings that we expected. I, I think that's uh, pretty well documented. Um, one of the fears that Republicans had uh, I think is very well founded, and it was the, the camel in the tent phenomenon. They say, once you give people these quote unquote benefits, you'll never get them back. And that was made in a very pejorative sense for people who don't believe in certain aspects of welfare provisions and so on. Uh, but whatever your opinion about that is, I think it's true. When you start expanding coverage, it's very, very hard to get it back. I think, and. You know, each side has their anecdotes, but when you start hearing about people who never had coverage, like in New Haven, you know, people started coming into primary care clinics, they've had diabetes, they had an egg, leg, I mean, I've met these patients, you know, they now have coverage. I, I think just politically, it's gonna be very hard to roll that back, but that's just purely an opinion. This, I mean, everyone in the audience may have a different opinion. I don't, I don't. Yes, sir, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, say that again? Okay.
So, so I don't know the answer to your broader question. It's like Bob and I were talking last night about w one of the provisions about nat you know, cross-state coverage. I, I think it's a, a red herring. Uh, but just to reinforce your point, in my um, statewide survey of Connecticut physicians, and I know this is very parochial, but the number one complaint was dealing with the uh, multiple mandates and coverage provisions and the logistics of dealing with that. So that's driving people insane. And some of my friends run the uh, New Haven, uh, Yale New Haven hospital system, which now is, by the way, one of the biggest hospital systems in the country. It's, it's uh, well, metastasized isn't the right word, but it's grown <laughs> dramatically. Uh, so it's become a huge deal. And the inefficiencies in the way we're dealing with those kinds of issues, I, I think, is unsustainable. I don't know what the way out is. Maybe some of the other speakers will have some, but it's a huge cost in our system. And by the way, there's a, you know, I painted my nephews in kind of glowing terms. It is true, every time I go home, he complains about the Canadian healthcare system. Uh, but they don't have the kind of the paperwork and regulatory and uh, procedural issues. That I think that's what you're asking about overall, right? Yeah. Is it, yes. One more? Sorry, is that okay? Well, one of, the, one of the slides I flew through, and I'm sorry, was uh, Commonwealth Fund did these studies of how many people reported not being able to get an appointment because of a physician, not being able to get an appointment because of insurance, and so on. There was, I think, four questions there. And that last slide with several uh, lines, and I won't put it up till later, uh, all those rates, with the exception, I think, of getting an appointment had dropped like 10 or 20 percent. So clearly, uh, people are getting more access and charting to use the system more. Uh, the study I just mentioned uh, was that we haven't seen the corresponding drop in emergency room rates. I, I, I don't see how that can't go down, but we've had, exp like when Medicaid was introduced, we had a similar phenomenon. I remember Rogman in the very early years found that uh, people had set patterns of utilization that weren't changed by coverage. So I think that may be what's going on now. And that as we move forward, you're going to see more uh, comprehensive, more, you know, you're going to see switches in uh, behavior patterns. This is pretty new for people who've, who haven't had health coverage for decades. So I went over my time. I apologize. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to the rest of the day.